Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the JDRF webcast on World Diabetes Day, Accelerating Progress on the Artificial Pancreas. My name is Doug Lowenstein. I'm a member of the JDRF board. And my link to type 1 diabetes is my daughter, Emma, was diagnosed uh, 11 years ago when she was age 14. And uh, someone from JDRF arrived in our living room with a bag of hope. And from then on, we have <clears throat> put a great deal of our lives into the hope and the progress that JDRF has made uh, attacking this disease. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today and to present to you uh, two of the uh, senior folks in the JDRF, Jeffrey Brewer, the CEO, uh, and Aaron Kowalski, who heads the Artificial Pancreas Project here at the JDRF. I'm going to turn things over to Jeffrey and Aaron for a few minutes. They'll make some opening remarks, and then we'll get right into your questions and take as many of them as we can. Again, thanks for being here today, and Jeffrey, over to you. Thank you, Doug. And thank you all for joining us today for World Diabetes Day to talk about the artificial pancreas. I'm here as the CEO of JDRF, but more importantly, as a volunteer and a father of a child with type 1 diabetes, my son, Sean, who was diagnosed about nine years ago. It's been an exciting time for the artificial pancreas project over the last few months. Uh, we, had, we have an opportunity here that we want to talk about that builds on about six years of progress at JDRF. We have, uh, back in 2005, established the artificial pancreas project. Since that time, we've created a, a network of sites across the globe in order to stimulate research into algorithms that will one day be able to control insulin dosing based on continuous glucose monitor data. We've not only established those academic sites to research the opportunity, we've also incorporated the companies who make the leading medical devices across the world in order to partner with those academic researchers in order to deliver technologies which will improve the lives of people living with type 1 diabetes to help keep them healthier and safer on the way to a cure. Over the last few months, we've seen these technologies mature to a point where now we're ready to move out of a laboratory, out of an inpatient hospital setting, and actually into the real world to start testing how these kinds of technologies will benefit people living with type 1 today. We are here to talk to you today about the critical inflection point at which we need the FDA to help us with this effort. It was in February of this year that JDRF, working with the leaders in the type 1 diabetes community, the clinicians who are treating patients with type 1 diabetes, the researchers who are researching the technologies that will be incorporated in the artificial pancreas, the companies that are in fact going to make these devices, everyone got together and recommended guidance to the FDA in terms of how they should regulate these devices, how they should test them to make sure they're safe and effective. Over the last few weeks, We've had over 110,000 people sign signature, sign a petition that urges the FDA to adopt that guidance, which has been recommended by the type 1 diabetes community. In December, the FDA is going to come back with their answer. Um, we believe that uh, what the FDA does is going to be pivotal in terms of influencing the future of this device. But today, we're here to answer some of your questions about the artificial pancreas, this project, and what JDRF is up to generally. Uh, thanks, Jeffrey, and I'm going to turn it over to Aaron, who heads the uh, Artificial Pancreas Project here at JDRF, and uh, going to talk a little bit about the status of the research and the progress of the research. Uh, Aaron? Thanks, Doug. So I'm Aaron Kowalski. I am a scientist at JDRF. I head up a team who work on this project. And uh, like Doug and Jeffrey, I have a personal connection to diabetes. My brother, Steve, was diagnosed when he was three, uh, over 30 years ago, and I was diagnosed when I was 13. So I'm a scientist at JDRF, but I also... Um, appreciate the urgency that people feel and uh, the challenges of dealing with type 1 diabetes. So the artificial pancreas, I think the uh, first thing that's important to um, uh, enunciate upon is what are we talking about here and what is it and uh, the different types of progress that we're making. Uh, there's kind of two different things that we're working on right now in the nearest term are what we would call low glucose suspend products and these are devices that would try to minimize lows. So simply turning down or turning off the insulin pump as people are getting low, obviously it makes no sense uh, to pump insulin into somebody when they are uh, below 70 or below 60. And then the first generation of artificial pancreas uh, uh, devices, artificial pancreas devices, would be systems that really start to dose insulin when people have high blood sugar. So the question becomes, can that be done? Um, our ultimate goal would be to have a fully automated system, but I think in the near term, uh, we can do uh, semi-automation and, and do it well. 
We've made incredible progress. We'll get into some specifics, but I can tell you for the first time ever, um, we have patients now in the real world wearing some of these devices where they're dosing the insulin automatically, going out to restaurants, sleeping in hotels. Uh, these studies just happened in France and Italy. Uh, about two weeks ago, they launched. So as Jeffrey said, our goal is to provide a pathway so people with diabetes can realize the potential here. It's great that the research is happening. We can get into the specifics. But for JDRF to be successful, uh, people like your children, my brother and I, and all people with type 1 diabetes need to realize this potential. And that's why we need a pathway here in the United States, as well as around the world, uh, so that the uh, promise that we're seeing in these experiments that are happening in academia can be realized in the real world. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, we're going to now get to your questions. Uh, the first question, uh, several people have asked a question along these lines, Alexa Labella and several others, and it boils down to the simple question of why is JDRF pushing the artificial pancreas so hard at this time if it's not a cure? Well, uh, JDRF was founded 41 years ago in order to cure this disease, to remove the disease from the lives of uh, the children of the parents who founded this organization. Uh, we remain no less committed today to curing this disease than were those parents sitting around the table 41 years ago. However, we don't want to be forced to choose between a cure in the future and safety and health and ease of life until that cure. So JDRF is committed to both of those things. We're committed to curing this disease one day, but in the meantime, we're committed to advancing the research and the development of tools and technologies that will keep people safe and healthy on the way to that cure. And I often say that, in fact, uh, you need to be alive for the cure in order to take advantage of it. And this is a device, a technology, which will help people to uh, stay alive and healthy on the way to that cure. It's also important to point out that, in fact, the cure will probably require technologies like an artificial pancreas. So when one day we talk about reversing autoimmunity and actually giving a person new beta cells, maybe transplanted beta cells or beta cells that are regenerated within a person's own body, in fact, we're going to need to have glucose control in order to allow those cells to take root. We now know, based on our research into islet transplants, that high levels of glucose are actually toxic to transplanted beta cells. And we believe would also be uh, toxic to the regenerated beta cells. So a, a, an artificial pancreas technology is very likely to be a bridging technology that will allow a cure someday in the future. So they're, they're very much related and not uh, mutually exclusive. Yeah, and, and Doug, I would add that uh, there's research going on now that's showing how important this is. We talk about being advocates, and one of our great successes over the last year was renewing the Type 1 Diabetes Special Funds. Our advocates really weighed in on Washington and made that happen. There's a trial happening now through NIH looking at kids who come in uh, with diabetic ketoacidosis with a new diagnosis of Type 1 diabetes, and they're putting these kids right onto a closed-loop system. So fully automated closed loop, but in the hospital, and then sending them home after a few days with the CGM and the pump. And the idea here is we can save their beta cells. So we all know there's a honeymoon stage, that there's still some cells that make insulin. This is important. It helps make glucose control easier, um, probably reduces the risk of complications in the future. Extending that period could be as simple, we think, as giving them better glucose control right out of the gate. So uh, like Jeffrey, I think um, from a, a scientific perspective, we fully agree that the um, artificial pancreas is a near-term solution. A biological cure is going to take um, longer, and we have the technology right now to close the loop uh, some of the time. So that's why we're passionately pushing that. And, and let me just ask a quick follow-up, because I, if I listen to both of you correctly, the artificial pancreas has gotten a great deal of attention over the last several months for understandable reasons, because there's this FDA process that is sort of reaching a point of, of finality. But uh, I, as I understand it, JDRF continues to put a very substantial amount of its research dollars into the cure therapies as well as the treatment therapies. Is that accurate? That's correct. As long as you, if you define a cure as reversing autoimmunity and giving a person new beta cells, returning to the biological condition from before you had type 1 diabetes, uh, the bulk of our research dollars are still spent in that area. Right. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, we have uh, several questions again along these lines. Uh, Juan Antonio Dominion, uh, among others, has asked exactly how the artificial pancreas will work. Uh, and as you 
move it forward, as it moves forward to, to second and third generations, will it eventually be implantable? Or is it going to always be a device that's externally worn? Yeah, that's a great question, and I get that question quite a bit. And I want to be really clear about how we see an artificial pancreas evolving. What we're trying to do right now is take a continuous glucose monitor, tie it to an insulin pump, and have it run automatically. So what we know can happen right now is we can minimize a lot of lows. There's a product, for example, one of the things that we're really passionately advocating for right now that's been available for um, over two years around the globe. Three years. Over, well, coming up on three years now, um, that turns off insulin delivery when somebody's low. Now, in my family, severe hypoglycemia was an ongoing problem. I've given uh, multiple uh, glucagon injections and uh, seen how dangerous this can be. Um, it, can, it can be lethal, uh, uh, and that's, it's terrible. A and to have pumps that pump insulin right now when somebody is severely low and the CGM is telling them this is, is um, not right. So th that's the first step. That's a baby step, but it's important and potentially life-saving uh, step. The, the uh, research on predictively turning down the pump is also very, very promising. Now, we do have some good news on that front. We uh, just got approval from FDA to do the first outpatient studies of a pump sensor combo that would turn down insulin when somebody's getting low. And I think that could be very meaningful. So when we talk about an artificial pancreas, I think the first real artificial pancreas in my mind, again, is one that starts to dose insulin. I think a lot of the folks out there who we wear CGM will say, well, I'm not sure, I'm comfortable with that yet. Uh, the CGM's not accurate enough. Can this really be done? I think the, the first systems that we're thinking about, the first artificial pancreas systems, will reduce low and high blood sugar. It won't try to make things perfect, but it'll reduce lows and highs. For example, the data we have from the JDRF trial, CGM trial, where we studied CGM use in people, showed that if you have an A1C of about 7.5, you're spending almost half of the day above 180, and almost an hour a day below 70. We could absolutely fix that with today's technology. So you would still be doing what you do with your, your I'm reaching for my pump and my sensor here, what you're doing with your diabetes, but if you um, are asleep, uh, if you're at school and not paying attention, um, uh, for whatever reason that, that the glucose is out of range, it would bring you back into range. I think in the future, we believe that the sensors need to get better and the insulins need to get faster to fully automate a machine and restore blood sugars to what people with diabetes uh, um, uh, experience. Uh, and those are projects we have ongoing, major investments into faster acting insulins and better sensors. But in the near term, there's no doubt that we can do this. The research shows it works. It's, it works incredibly. Again, we're doing it out in the real world now. Um, and this is why it's such an important time for FDA to provide the guidance, because the research can work well, but we need a pathway to the market, and that's what we're really focused on. Um, uh, Aaron, can I just ask this question? Um, and, and this was what some of the questions have asked. Is it, is it a dream? Is it science fiction that eventually we could have an artificial pancreas that's implantable? So that's, that's something that um, I think is, is not a dream. In fact, we, we know that in Europe there are people with implantable insulin pumps. Um, I think from a, you know, I, I always boil diabetes down to two main things, glucose control and quality of life. And we want to, I think the, the reason that the artificial pancreas is appealing to me is we could maybe affect both of those for a positive. Relieve some of the burden on people and help their glucose control get better. I think the current implantable insulin pumps are still quite, quite big. Um, a lot of people who use them swear that it's been transformational. They actually have an added benefit and they deliver the insulin in the, the inside of the body versus we deliver it into the skin right now. Uh, so I think if you, you could make the pumps smaller, and I think the sensors are certainly going in a direction uh, that they could be implanted, that that is a future possibility for sure. But in my, in my mind, many, many people are wearing sensors and pumps right now. And we can absolutely have the sensor and pump talked together and do some of the work that people with diabetes are doing, essentially right now. And that's why, again, we have these near-term opportunities. We have longer-term th things that will be better, certainly. 
but we're trying to do each of them. Well, well, this is the important thing. The artificial pancreas is not going to be one product. It's going to be a sequence of products, iterations, uh, all of which uh, will be tending towards greater automation. Um, smaller, uh, uh, less uh, uh, apparent to the user, and then hopefully one day implantable, which is the ultimate in terms of concealing and, and user uh, um, Great. comfort. Great. Um, we, um, I, I, we talked a lot about the FDA here, and I, I think it might be helpful to set the stage for why and what role they play in this process. Uh, Aaron, you just referred to a guidance uh, document, and, and these are terminologies that most of us aren't terribly familiar with. We don't live in the day-to-day -day world of FDA and drug regulation. So perhaps, uh, since everybody's aware of how much attention we focus, and you've referred to it, Jeffrey, in your remarks uh, over the last few months, uh, could one of you uh, uh, briefly describe why we need an FDA guidance? What does it do? I, you even referred to trials that are already going on in the United States. So if we're able to have those trials, why do we need the FDA guidance? Why is it so important? Can you talk a little bit about that, Jeffrey? Or? Or Aaron? Sure. I, I think the, the, the crux of this, again, is in academia, we've been doing studies in the hospital, and they've been very, very promising. We have products available abroad uh, that are the first steps, and we think very clinically meaningful. So the question becomes, here in the United States, uh, what needs to happen? And I think what we've seen is a disconnect a bit in terms of the expectation for the types of trials that would be used to prove um, uh, that these, these are devices are safe and effective. And I think here we are great partners with the FDA in the sense that we all want the same things. Obviously, we represent people with diabetes. My brother and I live with diabetes. Your children represent, uh, live with diabetes. Um, we don't want products that are unsafe. But what we're seeing is um, a, maybe a, a level of rigor from the FDA right now uh, that is out of line with, with what clinicians and patients with diabetes would expect. So for example, to be very specific here, when we talk about a pump uh, that shuts off insulin when somebody's low, I think everybody in the room here who lives with diabetes would think that that's a no-brainer. Um, there is a hypothetical risk uh, that you would shut it off when the sensor was reading wrong, or reading high, when, or telling you you were low when your blood sugar was actually high, could you get into a risk for ketoacidosis? And the data is overwhelmingly no. But um, there's been a lot of discussion um, within the FDA, uh, what types of trials do we need to do to prove that? And this is where we need guidance. And this is where we need patients and clinicians to weigh in on this guidance. So FDA put out guidance on low glucose suspense systems. So again, already been approved and used by thousands of people abroad. Um, and we're still trying to figure out what studies to do. And we don't think that's acceptable. We so, need to move faster. So in a sense, what you're saying, if, if I follow it as a layperson, is that what the guidance does is lay out a pathway for the clinical community to follow. And, and to the extent that it follows those pathways and the results are, are positive, it makes it easier to get the FDA's approval for a yeah. device. To move forward to, to the next step, to which is step. ultimately to patient availability of these right. devices. All right, thank you. And I, and I think to, to just be very clear, we don't, we, our, our expectation isn't to not test these devices. I mean, I think we have world-class doctors and researchers who are ready to do that. It's to define what are the right trials, and for people with diabetes and people who treat people with diabetes to have a voice in that. Yeah. And I think this is where the, uh, the JDRF and the patient community more broadly and the doctors are an important part of the discussion with the FDA in terms of how do you judge uh, risk and benefit. Uh, in this case, the benefit is that potentially you could save a life by turning an insulin pump off and actually stopping insulin delivery when a person could be having a, uh, a seizure based on hypoglycemia. Um, the risk is that if the sensor was reading a little high, you might wake up in the morning with slightly elevated blood sugar. Now, if you're a person living with type 1 di diabetes, you know that that's a no-brainer trade-off, that you'll trade slightly elevated blood sugar in the morning for potentially saving your life one night. Right. You, you know, you've touched on, uh, Kristen Nelson asked the question uh, that we have here, and by the way, thank you everyone for all the questions. Keep them coming in. We're going to try to get to as many as possible. Uh, but Kristen's question really goes to the points that you both made, which is sort of a what if. Uh, if we don't get a guidance that meets our expectations, where does that leave us? What happens with the R&D? What happens with the artificial pancreas? Does it not, uh, you know, is it, is it stopped in its tracks? And, and on the other side, what if we get a guidance that's very comparable to what we do want, 
how does that affect the research process and the timelines? Could you? Well, uh, as a, a, I mean, a, a very basic uh, uh, measure is that if we get a very unhelpful guidance, that at the very least, people in this country are going to continue to be deprived of the cutting edge of technologies for automating the delivery of insulin, for adding safety features around the delivery of insulin through a pump. But perhaps more damagingly than just Americans not being able to get access to this technology, it could actually kill commercial interest amongst companies in this space and startup companies which are going to be developing the next generation of technologies which will one day deliver us the full automation. Um, it may prevent us from leveraging our uh, academic research sites here in the U.S. As you said, Aaron, we're now uh, funding a lead investigator from Virginia on a trial that's having to take place in France and Italy because we cannot do this in the United States today. So um, it, it not only is going to set back uh, patient availability, the ability of uh, the leading research sites to do this kind of cutting red research, but it might potentially deprive everybody around the world uh, in the future if companies are no longer interested. I think, I think it's a really important point. I mean, one of the things that I'm very sensitive to is every day when I come to work or go out, I feel for four things in my pocket. I have a CGM, I have a pump, I have a BlackBerry, and I have a wallet. And I can do that. I have a jacket on a lot of the time. But when you think about a three-year-old with diabetes, you think about, really, I mean, anybody with diabetes will benefit from these innovations happening quickly. And if there is not the opportunity to drive this, you know, integration in the cell phones, combining sensor and pump sites, I mean, all these things are teed up. But there has to be a roadmap, and and that's what we're lacking. So you know, JDRF is an international organization. When I um, am looking at our research, we have the ability. We have great sites in in um, England and France and Italy and Israel and Australia right now doing a lot of this research. As Jeffrey pointed out, much of it is driven by uh, not as not only those outstanding investigators abroad but our um, United States-based investigators, but they can't do the clinical trial work here, or it's going much slower. So um, to, to drive towards these better solutions where we have smaller, more integrated, not only just the automation, um, we need a roadmap, and it's really, really important, and hence. Uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, you both sort of made points that raise, I think, uh, an obvious question to me, because in a sense what you're saying is that, um, that uh, because the, the, the FDA has the potential to chill incentives for companies to get into this space, because if they make the process too complicated and, and too expensive to do, it disincentivizes companies from getting into this space. And you've also suggested that it, that it also has an impact on the research community and where the research dollars flow. Um, and that seems like it should be obvious to the FDA, which obviously is, is focused on getting out, uh, proving products that are safe and effective. Uh, but uh, it, it, it does raise the question, in my mind at least, as to why the FDA uh, is moving so slowly in this space. Uh, or is it? I mean, is it just going through the legitimate processes, or is, it, is something holding this up? I think um, if you listen to Commissioner Hamburg, the head of the FDA, uh, she talks a lot about regulatory science. And this is a great opportunity for JDRF, who is the leading uh, funder of diabetes research, uh, charitable funder in the world, to be well aligned with what um, FDA is looking for. I think what we've struggled with over the last few years is uh, consensus on what the right types of trials are. And as we've had that debate, we've lagged behind. Um, on December 1st, FDA has promised guidance that could really reset the whole equation because uh, they, they put out guidance on low glucose suspend. Again, those products are already available abroad. And we hope that we'll see them here um, uh, soon, but we've fallen behind. Nobody has an insulin dosing system in the world yet. The first outpatient trials are just starting to happen. And if we can get good guidance, um, I think we could catch back up here. So that's why this um, timing is really important. I do think um, w we've slipped a little bit. Uh, uh, it's been a debate. I think we're coming to a good conclusion of that debate. Uh, unfortunately, it's taken too long, uh, in my opinion. Um, but uh, now this next guidance, which is really going to drive when the pump starts dosing insulin, we, as Jeffrey pointed out in the beginning, we've, we have clinical consensus here. We let a group, ADA, the clinical endocrinologists, the diabetes educators, all aligned on this position uh, to help FDA um, make a rational, scientific, clinical um, uh, 
roadmap um, decision forward. So um, it's frustrating. Uh, I think you can sense that. I, again, have had uh, a personal, many, many personal experiences with severe hypoglycemia. It's, it's a terribly frightening and um, uh, horrible thing for people with diabetes. And that's the frustration with the low glucose suspend, suspend piece. Um, with the dosing of insulin, I hope uh, that we see on December 1st or before then uh, uh, reasonable guidance that we can get behind and start to drive this process faster. Thank you. Um, a lot of folks are now asking questions that are uh, maybe moving beyond some of this bureaucratic uh, uh, process, not to trivialize it, because it's obviously important at FDA that they, you know, they get it right and they go through the right processes. Uh, but uh, really what we all want to know is, how soon, in the best case, do we think we can get to outpatient trials? How soon do we think, if all goes well, that we can actually have patients in the United States in large-scale clinical trials uh, walking around with this device? So I think, uh, as we mentioned, we have our first patients uh, wearing this system. And essentially, this isn't um, uh, uh, super high-tech stuff. We're taking today's pumps and sensors. So for example, in the uh, study that's going on um, in Europe right now, this is a Dexcom sensor and an insulin Omnipod talking to an Android, a uh, stripped down essentially from a software perspective, Android phone, where the algorithm, which is the software that interprets the CGM and tells the pump how much insulin to give, is, um, is controlling their diabetes. So this works, and the and doing a very simple thing, uh, controlling basal uh, rates overnight to try and keep a person safe, keeping people in a a, a a more normal glucose range. So so this is happening, and if you look at the hypoglycemia studies, for example, we're doing hypoglycemia studies in Australia using the Medtronic system, which I think are, are could be transformational. They'll it'll predictively turn off the pump, so not only will you you won't already be low. It's or looking ahead to see if you're getting low. And the really interesting thing about this is it could have an added benefit, and we're testing this. It's a really outstanding investigator uh, named Tim Jones in, in Perth, Australia. What if, we, what if we get low less? You may regain some of your sensation of hypoglycemia. So there's a lot of benefits. This is, uh, uh, as you know, some people become hypo unaware. So that's happening in the outpatient. We just got uh, approval on a, a trial here in the United States to test the hypoglycemia system, predictive again, um, in a partnership with NIH at Stanford and the University of Colorado that will launch soon. So I would hope that in 2012 we're doing significant amount of work in the outpatient. And then again, what it really becomes is uh, this data, I am very confident all the data to date has shown that this works really well. The computer does a lot better job than people with diabetes because it can watch 24 hours a day. Um, that this guidance will provide the companies a roadmap to commercialize these ideas. Um, you've really taken us in a, uh, to a, a point, we have a question from Michael Vetter. Uh, and again, several people have this question. And this is the kind of, you know, nuts and bolts, real world issues I think all of us think about here, which is, great, we have an artificial pancreas, but it's got to cost a fortune. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, it took a while to get CGMs yeah. uh, 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 approved for use by insurance companies. So let's assume we have an artificial, artificial pancreas in a few years, Jeffrey. What are we doing and what can we do to encourage and ensure that when it is available, insurance companies will actually cover it because obviously if they don't, it will be on the means of many of us. Well, th this is a, a question I've gotten uh, quite often. Uh, well, if the artificial pancreas is so expensive that only the rich can afford it, then is that a real achievement? And uh, the answer is, if only the rich can have access to it, then we'll never see it. Because the way our healthcare system works today, in fact, it has to be reimbursed by the government and by healthcare insurers in order for this to be a market that companies are interested in producing a product for. So at the end of the day, making sure that there is reimbursement at a level which is going to incentivize companies uh, and allow companies to provide this solution to everybody who needs it is completely in our interest in getting 
the artificial pancreas. It's completely in the company's interest to be able to sell the artificial pancreas. In fact, this is something from a very early point that we focused on in terms of our strategy to drive development of an artificial pancreas. Continuous glucose monitors are a component of an artificial pancreas system. When JDRF did our CGM trial uh, back in, uh, I guess, 2008, 2009, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, we didn't see that CGM was reimbursed broadly. And that was a big problem because unless the companies who made CGM could actually get it reimbursed, they wouldn't be incentivized to be investing in the subsequent generations of the technology, which would become increasingly reliable and accurate such that uh, they could someday be a part of an artificial pancreas solution. So one of the things that we proved was that if you had a CGM and you wore it, that in fact you would do a better job of managing type 1 diabetes. You'd have a lower HbA1c and you'd end up less in the emergency room for severe hypoglycemic events. And in fact, that uh, study proved uh, that insurance companies would be better off paying for this technology than not because their patients would actually experience lower costs in terms of their healthcare uh, 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 reimbursement uh, levels. Same thing is going to be true with an artificial pancreas. It will save lives, it will save costs, and demonstrating that is a key part of our strategy. Because at the end of the day, if only people who can pay out of pocket for such a device have access to it, it won't be a big enough market for companies to want to exploit. Are, are we in conversation now with insurance companies or even the federal government, which in effect is the largest insurer through Medicare and Medicaid? Um, and they s sometimes lead the way. So if they sort of include this in their approved devices, um, that's, that's going to significantly affect the insurance companies. So is there any conversation going on to lay the groundwork uh, for this uh, hopefully widely available artificial pancreas? A absolutely. Network? Absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, not only conversations with the payers themselves, but also we've engaged in health economics research, which demonstrates that uh, Medicare would save billions of dollars over and above the cost of such a device, which would be a premium above today's insulin pumps and CGMs. But even when you take that expense, you would save billions of dollars in terms of healthcare costs for Medicare. So the argument needs to be made on a number of levels, including at that level. And this is all part of preparing the market for eventual delivery of such a device. Uh, you know, it, it, when you talk about markets, we know that type 1 diabetes, there are somewhere in the range of 3 million people in the United States with type 1 diabetes. We think that's a lot of people, but in the greater scheme of things, it's a relatively small disease, which is one of the problems in getting manufacturers to focus resources on this space. But there's type 2 diabetes, which is growing very rapidly. And, uh, and I'm curious whether an artificial pancreas, uh, Aaron, might have applicability to type 2 patients, which would dramatically broaden the patient population and I assume significantly increase incentives for companies as well as insurers uh, to look more kindly on it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I think the type 1 and type 2 diabetes are two different diseases that end in kind of the same place, which is hyperglycemia or high blood sugar. And high blood sugar, whether you're a type 1 person or a type 2 person, is bad. It causes the long-term complications. Um, the other thing about type 2 diabetes is over time, just like a person with type 1, our, our beta cells are wiped out by our immune system. And type 2 people, you start to lose beta cell function, and you can significantly lose beta cell function to the point where, as you, as you know, many people with type 2 diabetes have to go on insulin. So the, the applicability of an artificial pancreas, to me, is really about um, will somebody be willing to wear it? And we don't see as many uh, people with type 2 wearing pumps and sensors, and I think this is where uh, it's going in that direction, and it has to be easier. But from a biology or physiology perspective, getting people um, on insulin and having that insulin regulated better could have significantly positive impacts in uh, type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, obviously. Another area that I'm... Um, pretty passionate about is pregnancy and diabetes. We know we need to do better um, in pregnancy and diabetes, and we're launching a major um, a push to try to have, facilitate better glucose control during pregnancy. It can be incredibly beneficial to the mother and the baby. So uh, I think there's a huge opportunity here. Obviously, more people with type 1 tend to wear pumps right now, but as these devices get smaller, easier to use, integrated into mobile devices, I think um, uh, we could really help uh, many people who struggle with hyperglycemia and the risk for diabetes complications with automation. Uh, thanks, Aaron. And I, I should just uh, tell people that uh, Aaron referred to the research involving uh, pregnancy. Uh, there's a wealth of information on the JDRF website about the research that we're doing. 
Uh, I, I suspect many people may have heard that for the first time and be quite interested in it. Uh, and you can find a lot of information about the ongoing research at the JDRF website, which of course we encourage you to do. Uh, um, Jeffrey, I'd like to ask you a question because JRF took out an ad in the major papers uh, last week or two weeks ago, um, and, it had a, a, and it, it had an interesting reaction. A lot of people were quite upset and alarmed because the ad included a statistic that one in 20 people uh, will, uh, with diabetes will die of low blood sugars. All of us on this panel have already referred to our loved ones with diabetes. I think all of us have had uh, been in exactly that place with a child uh, or, uh, or that has passed out. Um, and so um, it is a very scary thing. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that uh, data? Because I think a lot of people were quite jarred by it. I was quite jarred by it. Uh, and I'm curious just uh, what's the background for that? And in a sense, why did you feel the need as an organization to have that figure in that advertising in sort of a shock value kind of way? Well, I'll, I'll let Aaron speak to the data in, in just a minute, the one in 20 figure. Uh, it, it is a, a staggering and, and shocking figure that those of us with children uh, who have type 1 diabetes uh, certainly don't want to think about. And uh, However, it does resonate uh, in my personal experience where my son uh, actually had a severe hypoglycemic episode and uh, was in ICU for 48 hours for the first 36 of those. He couldn't speak or remember his name. Uh, thank God he came out of that um, and fully recovered. Uh, but uh, had he uh, been untended to for another hour or even 30 minutes when he was having a hypoglycemic seizure, he would be dead. Um, so this is real. Um, uh, I can't tell you how many people I run across uh, who tell me uh, just absolutely catastrophic stories of people who have died from type 1 diabetes, um, sometimes from hyperglycemia and ketoacidosis, uh, but uh, many times from hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. Um, one of our volunteers in the local area here in the New York metropolitan area just had a 19-year-old son die at college from hypoglycemia. So uh, it happens, and the reason we had to talk about it is not because we're trying to raise money. This isn't a fundraising campaign. These ads, which were in the New York uh, Times and the Washington Post, were keyed uh, to appeal to and deliver a message to influencers and decision makers uh, at the FDA and around the FDA to basically say that the tools we have today are not acceptable to manage living with this disease. That, in effect, um, today the blood glucose meter and the insulin are not enough. And as long as we have opportunities to translate technologies that are ready to actually be in the hands of patients, we need to do all we can do to make sure that we're impacting that 1 in 20 statistic. Uh, it's nothing that any of us want to talk about, but unfortunately we had to make a bold statement that this is an unacceptable state of affairs because uh, unless the FDA recognizes that, um, uh, I believe we were at uh, risk of getting some guidance which would not be favorable to the development of these technologies. So to the statistic yeah, and itself. to the statistic, I mean, this data is a, a compilation of a number of studies that have tracked uh, people with type 1 diabetes and when they die from type 1 diabetes. And uh, much of it comes from a, a, a doctor, Phil Cryer, at the Washington uh, University of, uh, in St. Louis, who has dedicated his life, really, to studying hypoglycemia and trying to help people um, uh, live with as little risk um, of hypo uh, as possible. And Phil is a an outstanding uh, committed doctor um, and he summarized a lot of that data. Um, it's not perfect in the sense that this is a population of people um, over time and we can't we don't have registries in the United States but it does highlight in study after study um, that this is occurring um, and it's it, and it's too high. So I think um, in fact that the risk has been increasing over well, time. I, I think the, the the risk of severe hypoglycemia as the tools have gotten better um, is is going in the right direction. There, there there, there is um, evidence of the JDRF CGM trial, the risk is going down. But to me, um, those data, uh, anybody, it's, it's one in a million, one in 20. Uh, it's anybody who dies now, and we have tools that are accessible around the globe and not here um, that could prevent some of those deaths. Uh, that's what that was about um, from my perspective. So. Um, it, it is shocking. Uh, I, I've mentioned a number of times today uh, my personal um, passion on this front because it's, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to ask a question that maybe is a bit broader, Jeffrey, um, because we're sitting behind this banner and we've noticed that JDRF has a new logo. It has a new tagline, which is um, 
uh, 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 something that I think the organization worked on for quite a bit. Uh, I think people might be curious to learn a little bit more about why is JDRF sort of reinventing itself uh, uh, these days? What, what's that all about? What's behind that? And how is that good for the community with type 1 diabetes? Well, I guess uh, there are a, a couple ways in, in which uh, uh, JDRF has evolved recently that are important to highlight. Um, one is uh, that we have e expanded our activities uh, to focus on improving the lives of people living with this disease on the way to the cure. I talked earlier about the need to live healthy and safe in order to take advantage of that cure. Um, our supporters are, are interested in that as well as the cure. And we have a commitment to doing both of those things. Uh, and we thought a tagline which is going to hint at that, actually state that explicitly, um, was going to be appropriate. So our new tagline is actually JDRF, Improving Lives, Curing Type 1 Diabetes. Um, curing Type 1 Diabetes, uh, of course, remains a uh, central focus for us. However, a as you'll notice, uh, it is curing, not a cure. Because one of the things that we have actually understood over time is that the cure isn't a single destination somewhere where we're going to open a door and it'll be there or there will be a, a final discovery in a laboratory someplace and we'll be done. A cure is going to be an iterative process um, whereby we have better treatments that maybe one day uh, start with an artificial pancreas and then result in immune therapies that regenerate beta cells. And in fact, at some point along this continuum, we'll, we'll see that we are in a place where people are going to feel cured. But until diabetes is not diagnosed in any person, and until every person in, in the world is, is free from this uh, burden of living with type 1 diabetes, we will not be done. But along the way, there are going to be a lot of successes and a lot of victories, um, some of which may be defined as a cure to some people um, in some situations at some stage of the disease. Again, recognizing that the person who has lived with type 1 diabetes for 40 years and who is now an adult um, has a certain experience with the disease and a certain set of needs in terms of what they are looking for JDRF to do for them that may be different from uh, me and my having a child in the home with type 1 diabetes. We all want a cure, but we also want to live well on the way to that cure. So I think that our new positioning, our new messaging, actually uh, gives us an opportunity to communicate uh, the, the breadth of what we're doing today across immediate tangible value to benefit the lives of people living with this disease. Uh, as well as a continued commitment to curing the disease. You also notice that we have dropped uh, juvenile. We stopped referring to juvenile diabetes. Um, we are not the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. We are JDRF. And that's a very uh, conscious um, uh, uh, decision um, to move away from what had become somewhat anachronistic because it's not juvenile diabetes anymore. The disease is actually type 1 diabetes. And also juvenile had a, a somewhat stigmatizing context, um, uh, a stigmatizing association for people who are living with the disease as an adult. Over 85% of people now who are living with type 1 diabetes actually are adults. And the latest statistics that we have indicate that maybe only half of those were actually diagnosed as children. So this is a disease uh, uh, for adults as well. And juvenile um, was not a uh, word um, that they were comfortable with. And it's not a word which uh, fully describes the population of people that we labor to benefit. So we've updated uh, our, uh, our image um, in terms of how we present ourselves to the outside world to better accord with uh, what we're doing today and the commitment we have to the people who live with type 1 diabetes. And also to representing the community of people, which is parents like me and children like my son, but also everybody who's living with the disease as an adult. Sort of, it sounds like it's comparable to the American Association of Retired Persons, which changed its name to the AARP because it found that people over 50, which is when you started to join AARP, uh, were no longer, were not retired yes. in this modern time. So they dropped the, uh, the name. So it sounds like that's sort of along the lines of what you've done here. That's a similar analogy. Yeah. I, I, I want to touch, come back to the artificial pancreas in, in, um, and ask this question because you, but we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about the FDA, which is in the executive branch of government. Uh, but I am curious um, whether we, we all hear all the stories about Congress and they can't get anything done. And uh, Is there any role for Congress in the artificial pancreas? Are they being supportive? Are they being helpful? Is there a bill to get the, can we order the FDA to do something? Is, is, is Congress, at least in this case, working in a bipartisan way to get something done, or is it not really applicable? 
Well, there's a huge role for Congress. Um, uh, and in fact, JDRF has worked very aggressively um, with our allies on the Hill. Um, 61 senators and uh, I think uh, about 287 uh, representatives in the House have signed a letter to actually urge the FDA to adopt the guidance which was presented to them on behalf of the community of uh, people living with type 1 diabetes and the doctors that are treating uh, people with the disease. And so we're proud that this is a bipartisan uh, initiative from that perspective. Um, Congress isn't in the business of telling the FDA what to do. They shouldn't be doing that. What they should be able to do is tell the FDA to make sure that they're listening to the stakeholders and that they're listening to the experts. Um, which is what we've asked them to do, and, and I think that they're going to play a big role in making that happen. Hey, you can't get 61 people to agree on anything in the Senate, so that's quite an issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to just touch on that a little bit further, too, though, because you, you touched on a very sensitive point, which uh, I think it would be worth hearing from you both on, uh, because some people might perceive that JDRF is trying to push the FDA to make a decision that is involved with bad science, or will result in a less safe product going to market, which of course nobody wants. Um, but, but I'm concerned that some people might have a perception that we're just trying to use all these advertising and Congress to, to push FDA to make a decision that perhaps is not in the best interest in the long run of anyone. Um, uh, could you address that? Uh, Jeff and, and uh, Jeffrey and Aaron? Well, I, I think it's, it's all about uh, what we're asking them to do, and we're asking them not to listen to us or to me or to Congress, but to listen to the experts who actually understand these technologies, um, uh, what the technologies can do in a real-world setting, and how people live with type 1 diabetes. Yeah, I mean, a, a great example of this for ex uh, is the low glucose suspend, and and the trade-offs that one's willing to make. So again, with the risk of ketoacidosis, we don't think that's a real risk. One of the other discussions that's been going on at FDA is, well, should we be willing to approve a product where your A1C could go up a little bit? So this is a product that you would have the option of turning on, on or off, and maybe sometimes it would turn off when your blood sugar really wasn't low, and maybe your A1C hypothetically could go up a little bit. So is that something that FDA should hold up, or should a person with diabetes have that? You know, some say in that. And I think the, to, to do the trials, um, again, we're not asking for FDA to rubber stamp stuff here. We're asking to do the research. I mean, I pride myself, and I think all of our uh, investigators do, in doing the best possible science. And what we're seeing over and over again is that these devices can help people. Um, you can't stare at your CGM 24 hours a day. It's impossible. A computer can. And we can add some automation uh, that would be beneficial. And I think we can do the trials to show the, the strengths and weaknesses. So our goal, again, here is not to um, pressure the FDA to make um, irrational decisions. It's to be aligned on de delivering as quickly as possible safe and effective products that, that also have the um, perspective of the patient and the clinician who have to weigh these balances on a day-to-day -day basis of living well, with we, 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 This takes into a great question we have from uh, Sugar Bedic. Um, a very creative handle, I might add. Uh, and I don't know if it's a he or a she, but Sugar Bedic asks, if we know we need more accurate sensor, sensors and faster insulin, why aren't we focusing more of our efforts on that than the artificial pancreas? Since artificial pancreas won't work very well without those two again uh, yeah inputs. that's a, g a great great question and and the thing that we're trying to do as jeffrey pointed out earlier is think of this in stages so we've 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 created a roadmap a roadmap i actually published this in a scientific journal a few years ago that focuses on what can we do with today's technologies and i think we can minimize lows so the data for example on the lows is we can minimize over three quarters of the lows that are experienced we think we could eliminate right now not 100%. So if you go in and uh, do a crazy, huge pre-bed bolus um, of way too much insulin, you're going to have to eat something. I mean, it, we can't prevent everything, but we can minimize a significant amount. We can also, if you think of today's sensors, um, and you think of the data, that, that the statistic I gave you before, if we're spending 12 hours a day above 180, well, the sensor may not be good enough right now to control your blood sugar to 90, where a person without diabetes is. But what if it could lop off uh, uh, seven of those hours above 180? 
and that's what today's sensors. So again, you're, you're not trying to get all the way down here, but you're trying to minimize a lot of this high blood sugar, which is what's driving the risk for diabetes complications. We can do that, and we can do that very safely. It's not going to be a fully automated system, but what it would do is rein in your blood sugar if you're not um, able to. You know, lop off the highs. Lop off the highs and lop off the lows. There's no doubt that with, uh, to get to a fully automated system or even close, we need the sensors and we need the insulin. We have a huge project that we just launched with the Helmsley Charitable Trust, which has a, uh, been an incredibly positive force in the world of type 1 diabetes, funding almost $100 million already in type 1 research. And they're partnering uh, uh, with us on an initiative to try to improve sensors. And again, some, some folks in the community might say, well, why is JDRF doing this when Medtronic and Dexcom and Abbott and other folks are? What we're trying to do is encourage the companies to develop sensors that would be suitable for closed loop control have redundancy, maybe even what we would call differentiated redundancy, sense glucose by two different mechanisms. A major initiative on that front. Um, a major initiative on faster acting insulins. So again, the, the way that that's going to happen though is I'm firmly convinced that with today's sensors and pumps, uh, we can lop off highs and lows. To get to more automation where you're maybe you're just um, bolusing before a meal and everything else is controlled, those things are going to come. They're going to take a little more time because these initiatives are rolling uh, and, and some research still has to be done. So um, we're focusing on both, but again, trying to prioritize that there are some near-term wins. I think if, ev if everybody out there uh, could go to bed and say, I could uh, eliminate three quarters of my lows right now, that would be a pretty big step forward. Yeah. Um, and, and that's how we're thinking. Or perhaps, things. Jeffrey, you can expand on that in a sense because uh, I think if I'm interpreting what Aaron's saying correctly, it's essentially... Um, we are focused on a lot of things. The artificial pancreas gets a lot of attention, uh, and we have made a lot of noise about that. But the JDRF has a $200 million research pro budget, and, and, and perhaps it's worth sort of just talking very briefly about the scope of JDRF research beyond the artificial pancreas and, and how some of that research inter interconnects with all the work that we're doing on this area so people get a sense that, that it all is tied together. Uh, we, uh, you know, we're... we're we're focused on uh, the longer term initiatives in terms of curing the disease, which boil down into reversing the autoimmune attack, actually helping a body to tolerate uh, the uh, antigens in the pancreas that triggered an immune response to begin with. Um, some very exciting research that we're doing with antigen specific vaccines, which are an approach that allows you not to use a broad immunosuppression mechanism such as one does with transplants in order to stem the autoimmune attack, but rather in a uh, pinpoint fashion to re-educate the body's uh, immune system to tolerate the thing that at the very beginning of the autoimmune assault was uh, what provoked the, uh, the uh, autoimmune fury. In fact, this um, is something that will be applicable to people who've had the disease for many years, um, particularly applicable and probably going to be tested um, uh, in an early setting uh, intervention for people to prevent going from having antibodies and early stages of type 1 to a person who goes on insulin. Because we believe that, that there's an opportunity at a crucial time to re-educate a person's immune system and basically stem the autoimmune attack before they've uh, destroyed the beta cells. However, for people who have, in fact, uh, uh, developed um, established diabetes and have some uh, uh, percentage of the beta cells who've been destroyed. Um, there's now exciting new research that indicates that you can take some cells in the body and uh, cause them to turn into other cells. So for instance, alpha cells, which are not attacked by the autoimmune assault, can be differentiated into beta cells, beta cells that could provide the best source uh, for replacement at some point down the line uh, for the cells that are lost in type 1 diabetes. Okay. There's uh, exciting opportunities yeah. in encapsulation um, where you can actually put an immune uh, uh, barrier around cells that could be transplanted. So a lot of stuff um, that we're focused on. The reason you hear a lot about APP is it's closest. The artificial pancreas is closest to people and you have the issues that people understand best. Right. And, and that leads me to a question. I think we're down to the last five minutes so I may actually uh, start doubling up on some of these questions, so hopefully we can, we can got to get many of them. I'm going to read this one. Uh, it comes from, I uh, 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 bungle the last name, but I think it's from David uh, Garacek, uh, and he wants to know, why is the FDA allowed to decide whether or not I, the individual, 
uh, risk a slightly higher A1C to implement the LGS. Um, Aaron, you want to take a crack at that? Well, very simply, it's because the lo law says they can. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't. Uh, I, I just want to say I don't think it's a bad thing that we have an FDA. I, I think it's a good thing that we have an FDA. FDA is a necessary part of the process of safe and effective drug and medical device development. Um, and, and there are not bad people at the FDA who are uh, causing this problem. Um, these are well-intentioned people who are trying to act in the, the public interest. Um, they may have some incentives working uh, against them. They may have uh, some lack in terms of the skills necessary to understand all of the issues. Um, uh, but uh, fundamentally, the answer to the question is um, we have a system um, that is uh, there to help protect people. And uh, we, protecting them is partly about keeping things uh, away from them, but it's also about facilitating access to things that can help protect them. So uh, FDA has to play both of those roles. And right now, I think they're a little too skewed towards protecting and conservatism, whereas we need to identify if there are opportunities to actually help people, that needs to be prized and balanced um, as much as uh, those risks. Yeah, so it's sort of like keeping the US in front as an innovator um, on, on the front lines of, of science and technology. Um, I, I, you talked a little bit a while, a, a while ago about Congress, and I just want to make a quick point. Uh, people uh, can find out if they're members of Congress, they're senators, uh, sign these letters by going to the JDRF website. And if they did, we encourage you to send them a note, send them an email thanking them for standing up for type 1 diabetes and for patients who are, need this technology. Uh, they do like to hear from their constituents, and we, and we encourage you to do that. Aaron, I, 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 this may be our last question from time standpoint. So. Um, can you, let's assume that everything works out as perfectly uh, at the FDA, um, and everything is lined up at the manufacturer level, and everything is lined up at the reimbursement level. Let's, everything breaks right. Can you walk us through very quickly um, exactly what are the stages of these studies? You know, how long would the inpatient studies be? How quickly do we get to outpatient studies? How big are those outpatient studies? How long do they have to go on? And I know to, you can't be ex uh, completely exact about that, but I think people would like to know, okay, this all sounds great, but if and things go right, really what are we talking about here? What, what's the process? Yeah, so when we uh, submitted our uh, draft guidance to FDA, there was a consensus of a number of leading clinicians around the country and researchers, as Jeffrey pointed out. I think we see a, a three-staged um, process. Uh, Testing it in the hospital makes a lot of sense, making sure everything works, it works well. Uh, probably doing a um, semi-real-world um, experience, whether you're on the campus of the, the university or um, in some somewhat constrained environment so you can keep track of people, make sure that there's nothing um, that happens that's unexpected, and then doing what we would call a pivotal real-world trial. I think um, the trials are, have already begun uh, in the first piece here, which is in the hospital. The data is coming in. Um, the companies obviously have to, have to build these devices. So the, the real important stage will be what type of pivotal trials um, are we looking at um, and what are the right outcomes. I think we're probably going to be looking at A1C type of outcomes and obviously weighing very he heavily for safety when you start to dose insulin. Um, and in best case scenario, again, I think in academia, we'll be doing these trials next year. So what we hope is the companies will follow right behind. We'll learn a lot from what's happening in the academic research setting. Um, when I mean academic, we're talking about leading diabetes clinics, partnering with the leading diabetes um, uh, research folks who are building the algorithms. And the, the bottom line, I guess, is the research will be done next year. And it's a commercialization process, and a lot will hinge on this guidance. But it's not a long process as we see it. Um, we think you could do this quite quickly. And the data, again, we've seen it over and over in the studies we've funded. The systems work really well. So, so in other words, not to put words in your mouth, uh, if things do work perfectly, we could see one of these products on the market in Less than five years? I, I would I'd be very disappointed if we weren't there less than five years. I hate to use the term, I would rather use, it's 2011. I mean, everybody in the diabetes world, hey, you know, five years is always from right. tomorrow. Um, uh, I would be very disappointed if we didn't have one of these systems in, in my brother and my hands and your children's hands um, by 2006. I'd be shocked and, so and very disappointed. It's a, a very hopeful way to, to uh, uh, start to close up. Jeffrey, I wanted to give you a chance as a CEO here of uh, JRF to sort of maybe make some closing remarks if you have any sort of summarizing where we are and 
where the organization is, and then we'll probably wrap up here in the next minute or so. Well, I, I just think we're at a very exciting time. Uh, I think uh, after many years, we see that the technologies are ready. Uh, that in fact we are able to demonstrate how these technologies can help people to live safer and easier and, and healthier with this disease in a real world setting. Uh, looking very much forward to being able to do that kind of research here in the United States and to seeing the companies that are able to deliver these kinds of technologies through to patients uh, making a commitment to doing so. Uh, but a lot hinges on what the FDA is going to do uh, within a month. And uh, we believe that uh, we've done everything we can uh, to help them uh, to come to a decision that's going to be both in the interest of patients, but also uh, protect and uh, keep safe those patients. And uh, we look forward to partnering with them going forward in order to, to make that a reality. Aaron, you have any Yeah, you know, the last thing I would say is we talked a lot about the challenges of diabetes today, but I uh, think of World Diabetes Day and I think of how far my family has come since 1977 when my brother was diagnosed, urine testing, two shots a day, uh, lots of complications uh, prevalent in people with type 1. And we've come a long way. And we can do amazing things. Just this past weekend, we had over 50 people run the New York City Marathon, many of whom had type 1, myself included. Um, we can do great things with diabetes, and I think we, I, I would uh, leave with a positive message that we have challenges. JDRF is, is aggressively um, working to um, make uh, those challenges go away and, and improve the lives of people with diabetes as we drive to our, towards a cure. But people should be hopeful. Um, taking off my scientist hat, um, I'm more optimistic than I've ever been with diabetes, and I think that's an important message today. Uh, and, and JDRF has a lot to do with that. Well, let me, uh, let me wrap this up here uh, with a uh, thank you to all of those of, of the, all those of you who have uh, been with us for all or part of this uh, webcast. Uh, we hope to continue to do these on a monthly basis, but we know your questions uh, may come uh, on a more rapid basis, and you should send them to JDRF. Uh, uh, check out our website, which has a lot of information on our research programs. Uh, and, uh, and if you can, uh, please, if you're not already a supporter of JDRF, not necessarily financially, there are many ways you can support the work that JDRF is doing in the advocacy space uh, uh, and, and being involved in the organization because letting people know uh, more about this disease, educating people, um, that and being an ambassador for type 1 diabetes. around the world. So we encourage you uh, to get involved in whatever way works best for you. And thank you again for joining us today. And thank you to Jeffrey and Aaron for their time. And um, we look forward to having another webcast uh, in the near future.